Welcome to the Life and Leadership Podcast. I am Katie. And I'm Tegan. And today we are talking about a topic that I know we can all relate to, the imposter syndrome. The imposter syndrome is, in a nutshell, the feeling that we are going to be found out for not knowing all of the answers, having the perfect skills, or being as great as people think we are, despite our track record of great success. And leaders in particular, this one is for you. We know you are out there suffering in silence. We have worked with so many leaders who appear to have it all together and in fact do, but definitely suffer from imposter syndrome. And today we are lucky enough to have as our guest, a foremost expert on the topic, Dr. Valerie Young. Dr. Valerie Young is an internationally recognized expert on imposter syndrome. She's been invited to speak on this topic by such diverse organizations as Boeing, Facebook, Microsoft. Soft, McDonald's, the list goes on and on, as well as over 90 universities in the United States, in Canada, and Japan, included, including Harvard, MIT, Stanford, and Oxford. Valerie's advice has also been cited in popular magazines and business outlets around the world, including notable names like CNN Money, BBC Radio, Newsweek, The Wall Street Journal, and O Magazine. Her award-winning book, The Secret Thoughts of Successful Women, Why Capable People Suffer from Imposter Syndrome and How to Thrive in Spite of It, um, is available in five languages. And P.S. on this topic, this is not just for women, even though the word women is in this title, and we will be sure to be very balanced in our conversation today about that. Lots of men I work with have bought this book to understand what some of the women on their team are dealing with and then found out they also were dealing with the imposter syndrome. (laughs) So on a personal note, I came across Dr. Young's work while doing research for a mastermind that I led for women a couple of years ago. I read the book more than once and in various ways on Audible. I've read it electronically. I have my tried and true print copy, which is well marked up. And I give it as a gift for clients on a regular basis. And the reason I'm plugging this so much is because this book radically normalizes people who thought they were alone in their suffering. It gives language to something that can be hard to put your finger on. And it is the only resource I've come across so far for this that provides truly actionable steps to working with and living with your imposter syndrome. So I'm personally extremely excited to be with you today. Thank you for joining the podcast, Valerie. I am absolutely thrilled to be here. Yeah. So we gave a, you know, a rather generic definition of the imposter syndrome because, of course, if you can write a whole book about it, it's hard to capture it in a sentence. Um, but for our listeners, how would you describe the imposter syndrome? I describe it as kind of the secret core belief that might even not even, you might not even have words for yourself, but this belief that deep down inside, essentially, I'm not as bright or capable or competent or talented as other people seem to think that I am. And this is despite evidence to the contrary, and and often overwhelming, compelling evidence of one's accomplishments or achievements. And and as Katie said, this kind of sense that, you know, I'm in over my head and they're going to be, I'm going to be found out sooner or later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think everyone can relate to that one. <clears throat> not everyone, <laughs> yeah, but a lot of people. people. Yeah, we, most of us have had hints of it at least, right? If, if not um, living with it full on, but yep. it's mm-hmm. a great, great explanation. Thank you. So we'd love to hear when have you experienced this in your life? When have you ever felt like an imposter? Oh gosh, lots of times. Uh, the first time though that I even heard there was a name for these feelings, I was a 21-year-old doctoral student at the same university where my mother at the time was working as a second shift custodian. So while she's cleaning the classrooms, I'm going to class. And someone brought in a paper by Dr. Pauline Clance and Dr. Suzanne Imes. Those are the two psychologists who first coined the term the imposter phenomenon as it is more accurately known in the world of psychology. It's actually not a diagnosable syndrome of any sort. Uh, But this student brought in this paper and said, oh my God, look at this study. These people found that a lot of bright capable, competent, they thought women, just at the time that it was just women, you know, think they're going to be found out. And I just sat there nodding my head like a bobblehead doll. I'm like, oh my God, that's me. Mm. I looked around the room and all the other graduate students were nodding their head like me. And the funny thing about that story though, is that we, we decided to start a little imposter support group afterwards to kind of talk about being intellectual <laughs> frauds and how we're fooling all of our professors. And everything went great 
for a couple of weeks. And then I started to have this nagging sense that even though everyone else was saying they were an imposter, like I knew I was the only real imposter. So I was like a super <laughs> imposter. Um, certainly, you know, there's moments that are triggers for people, myself included. So whenever you start something new or big or unfamiliar, it could be when you're in the spotlight in some way. Um, if Oprah called me tomorrow, I trust me, I would have an imposter moment. You know, I would talk myself down pretty quickly, but I would definitely have an imposter moment. But I think the most interesting imposter moment with me was that when I did get my, I was trying to get this book deal. I had an agent. She set up appointments with all these major publishing houses in New York. We had like seven appointments in two days. You know, and, and I was having this imposter <laughs> feeling, right? And the irony was not lost on me. I'm <laughs> pitching this book on imposter syndrome and I'm having this imposter experience. So not surprising. Perfect story though, after the fact. Yep. <laughs> so where does it come from, Valerie? I mean, <clears throat> there's more than one source and you talk about this in your book, but for our listeners, what do you want them to know about where this source is from for us? Sure. You know, and, and in the book, I really frame them as perfectly good reasons why you may like why you may feel mm -hmm. like a fraud. And, and I do that very intentionally because my mission is to have people do less psychologizing and more contextualizing mm -hmm. so that when you have an mm -hmm. imposter moment, you can kind of look around and go, well, why wouldn't I feel this way? Or this makes sense. I would feel this way. So, you know, for example, there are situational factors being a student you're going to be more susceptible, especially if you're going for an advanced degree. Because I mean, when you think about it, you're in an environment where your knowledge and intellect is literally being tested on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And you're also, again, especially on the, um, you know, when you're going for a, a master's or a doctorate, you're surrounded by very highly educated people. Somebody said to me recently, she said, this is crazy. I shouldn't feel like an imposter. I have a PhD. I said, no, you feel like an imposter because you have a PhD. Mm -hmm. You know, now mm. people look at you a certain way. They have certain expectations of your intellect and so on. Mm -hmm. It could be organizational culture. There are certain organizational cultures that can fuel self-doubt. I was speaking at um, Stanford University and, and a young man stood up and he said, what if you're in a very shaming culture? Mm. I said, are you in medicine? He said, yes. <laughs> I mean, they're really working to change that in medical education, but that had been the model for many years is to shame the resident for not knowing knowing something and you know mm. higher ed you know i mean for lots of reasons that, that that's a culture that you know where it's going to fuel a lot of self-doubt not just in students but also in faculty and in staff there's situational um i mean social factors you know a sense of belonging fosters confidence so when you walk into a classroom a meeting when you choose a field to go into or a business to start uh, any executive level in any organization when you go there the fewer people who look or maybe sound like you if English is not your first language, the more confident we just in, you know, instinctively feel. Conversely, the fewer people who look or sound like us, for many people it can and does impact how confident we feel. Especially if we belong to any group for whom there are stereotypes about competence, we're gonna be more susceptible. Mm -hmm. That makes total mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, absolutely. So I know we talked in the beginning that this is not only about women, yes. um, but what is your observation? Do you, um, how do you see it manifest differently in men versus women? Well, it is actually, it's one of the very few psychological kind of issues, if you will, where it was first thought to affect one gender, i.e. women, and very quickly determined there are a lot of men who also experience imposter feelings. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of individual men feel like imposters, but women kind of almost as a group are more likely, I mean, even there we're generalizing, Mm -hmm. Right. I've certainly met some women who don't identify, but it's less typical for me to meet a woman who does not identify. I think as a group, and this is true for anyone who feels like imposters, we're more likely, but women especially, are more likely to kind of internalize failure, mistakes, and criticism and blame mm -hmm. ourselves and men and boys. And there's research on this that suggests men and boys are more likely to externalize it, to find factors outside of themselves that explain why they failed. Yeah. So, but if, you, if you're always over-personalizing criticism or failure or setbacks, if someone says to you that report was inadequate, what we hear is, I'm inadequate. Mm -hmm. I think the big reason, and the other reason, is I think boys grow up, good, bad, or indifferent, with more pressure to be confident. 
You know, when you're a boy, you have to act braver and tougher than you really feel for survival, you know, with other boys. So I think for a lot of reasons, men tend to be more comfortable kind of jumping in and figuring things out as they go along. And women, again, as a group, like to know 150% before we dare, you know, raise our hand or put ourselves out there. Yeah. Would you say that that um, has come kind of from some socialization as well? Like it's not like a nature versus nurture, right? Like women um, kind of socialize from a young age to kind of pull back or to make sure everyone gets along. Make sure everyone gets, yeah, Mm -hmm. like some of those um, kind of social structures. Yeah, I'm sure that's absolutely part of it. No one's ever going to answer that question definitively. Just anecdotally, though, I meet a lot of mothers who just say, where does my son get his confidence? You know, and they'll find their five, six, seven, eight-year-old son just has like, you know, amazing amount of confidence and their daughter may or may not. And, and, And I know they're working really hard to, you know, raise kids equally and all that. So it's hard to tell where that exactly that that comes from. I think women, sometimes the whole fake it till you make it thing, women resist because it feels like it's dishonest or, you know, I don't want to lie, you know, and and Mm. men don't always kind of see it that way that, you know, it's not about lying or making stuff up. It's about sometimes you have to project more confidence than you really feel because you're confident you can figure it out as you go along that you don't need to know everything before you jump in. Yeah. We do a lot of coaching around that with our leaders for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So tell us about some of the famous people. I know you write about this in the book who have owned their experiences with imposter syndrome and talked openly about it. Oh God. So many people, Um, you know, Tom Hanks, Viola Davis, Tina Fey, Don Cheadle, you know, uh, my Angelo said, I've written 11 books. And every time I write another one, I think, uh oh, I pulled another one over on everyone and they're going to find out. You know, Sheryl Sandberg famously has talked about imposter syndrome. And last fall, Michelle Obama talked about having imposter syndrome. I wrote a blog post called Unpacking Michelle Obama's Imposter Syndrome, yeah. where I kind of raised the, the, the question shouldn't be, you know, why does Michelle Obama have imposter syndrome, but how could she not? Right. <laughs> oh, great reframe. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, she's first generation, you know, professional, first generation of family to go to college. First gens are more susceptible. Um, you know, first African-American first lady. There's always that additional pressure whenever you are the, the first from your, your social group to, to represent uh, your entire group. I mean, so for a lot of reasons, it makes sense that she would, she would have these feelings. I was listening to a lot of people, uh, especially in creative fields, which I'm going to go back to your question, Tiga, where do these feelings come from? It is true that people in certain fields are more susceptible. People Mm. in creative fields, writing, acting, producing, even uh, Chuck Lorre, producer of Three and a Half Men, Big Bang Theory has talked about feeling like a fraud when he walks onto the set because you're being judged by subjective standards by people whose job title is professional critic. Mm-hmm. The reason I work with a lot of tech companies and also in, in medicine is those are two areas, and I would add law in there, where the rate of change is, is happening so quickly, no human could ever keep up. That's right. Yeah. But we feel like we should. Mm. Right. Great insight. Um, you know, this it reminds me, in Chicago not too long ago, we had the Saturday Night Live traveling display up. Oh. I don't know if you guys heard about this. <clears throat> excuse me, and it walks you through the creative process that these people have to go through over oh, wow. the seven day period. And I could, it reeked of imposter syndrome because they could hear each other in, in the other rooms designing their skits for the next day. And then they all have to go up against each other to vie for the spot. So week after week, your ego gets crushed and bruised and crushed and bruised. And if you're lucky, your skit makes it to the stage. So um, such a good like kind of emphasis on the creative spot. Yeah, I cannot imagine how those comedians do that every week. Yeah, and they do talk about that feeling. They weren't using the phrase imposter syndrome, but they all talked about it in their little vignettes in that little museum about how doubtful they were every week of their capability, and despite the fact that they were on SNL, which none of right. us are going to be on, right? So, <laughs> well, I mean, because you're, you're only as good as your last performance yeah. or your last book. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a very different way of being judged versus an accountant for example, right? or somebody right. In, in marketing. 
Right. Where it's very black and white, what success looks like. And yeah. 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 Um, so, you know, Katie and I coach a lot of executives and, and for those of you listening, imposter syndrome happens in all walks of life at every level of companies. Level. Yeah. Um, and especially at the leadership level. So tell us why it's especially important for leaders and why this matters for them. Why knowing about the imposter syndrome matters? Well, I think it, it's, the higher you go, the more likely you are to feel like an imposter. I mean, it's counterintuitive because we think the more successful we are, I should feel less like an imposter. But in fact, you often feel like you're just fooling more people on a higher level. Totally. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a study out of the UK that in 2017, that I think it was 82% of um, uh, CEOs and 80% of managing directors, some numbers right around there, have, you know, had, said they had that feeling like they were out of their depth Mm -hmm. uh, in, in situations, which you're, you're going to. So it's pretty right. normal. But here's the thing. Even if you don't personally experience imposter syndrome, it's imperative, I think, that leaders understand imposter syndrome because there are behaviors associated with imposter syndrome. You know, these, these major corporations and universities don't bring me in to speak to their people because it's an interesting self-help topic. Right. They, they bring me in <laughs> because there are consequences, there's behaviors, and these behaviors have costs not only to the individual employee, but also their organizational costs as well. So if you manage, mentor, or parent another human being, you really need to understand imposter syndrome. Yeah. What are some of those behaviors that you see? I mean, we're assuming that these are business limiting behaviors. What are a couple of those that are sort of telltale signs in your experience working with leaders? Well, people who feel like imposters develop what Pauline Clance referred to as different coping and protecting mechanisms. So these are ways that unconsciously we have learned to kind of cope with kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop, mm -hmm. but also protect us from being found out. So it could range on one end of the continuum is the person who I refer to as kind of flying under the radar. So that's the employee who doesn't speak up in meetings, doesn't ask questions, doesn't share solutions or ideas, doesn't go for more challenging opportunities or assignments, might stay in a job they have long outgrown because it's safer there. Mm -hmm. So they're, what they're avoiding is you know, humiliation or embarrassment or failure. On the other end of the continuum are people who overwork and overprepare. And I don't mean good old fashioned hard work, right? We all have to work hard, <laughs> yeah. but more the sense that I have to work harder than everyone else because to cover up for my kind of supposed ineptness. Yeah. And then there's, there's ways people sabotage themselves. I met a woman recently, started a business, gave her first big client the wrong directions to a meeting twice. Mm. And she kind of realized, she thinks she was kind of secretly sabotaging, you know, unconsciously mm -hmm. sabotaging the relationship. There are people who job, job uh, hop. Mm -hmm. This guy said he leaves his job. He's a pretty senior guy. Like every four years, he figured that's about the time they'll be kind of on to him. I mean, yeah. he was not an imposter, but that was his strategy. Sure. It could be alcohol, substance abuse, never starting or finishing the yeah. book, the project, the business plan, the painting, you know, mm -hmm. procrastination. So all of those behaviors, they work. Mm -hmm. They do the job. They help us cope with the feelings and they help us avoid being found out. I mean, if you work crazy hard, you're probably going to be successful. But the question is at what cost? Right. Because mm -hmm. for all of those protecting mechanisms, there's always a cost. Mm -hmm. So by now there are listeners who are going, this is me. Yeah. Got my name all over the imposter Both, both hands up. Yeah. <laughs> so for those listening, what, what do they need to know that they can do about it, Valerie? Well, I think the, the first step is to give voice to these kind of nebulous feelings of, of imposterism. I, I'm sure there's some people listening right now who are going, oh my God, there's a name for this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and other people feel And other that people way. have it. Yeah. yeah. So that alone, I think, could be really liberating for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So talking about it is an important first step, but it's truly just a first step. Yeah. And I say that because I know people who have spent their entire life kind of going home at the end of the day, talking to their spouse or partner about, you know, my God, this is the big one. They're going to find out. It's going to be terrible. You know, and nothing, the needle never changes. So they're talking and talking, but it's not mm. changing, which is interesting because I found out that adolescents who co-ruminate, who dwell on negative thoughts and feelings with their friends, actually experience higher levels of anxiety and depression. Yeah, wow. So 
I tell people now that you can't share your way out of imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. So uh, the next question is, what can you do? Well, I would say three kind of core non-negotiable things. The first thing is to normalize imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. you know, wh when we realize that up to 70% of people have had these feelings at one time or another, it kind of begs the question, like, what's up with the other 30? Like, why aren't we studying them, you know? Way I mean, to flip that on its ear, Valerie. Love well, there's that. like, there's like, literally, there's probably over a thousand dissertations over the years, the decades on imposter syndrome, but maybe we should be studying that other 30. So I they have a question theory. themselves. Okay. I have a 30, I have a theory on the 30%. Some portion of that 30% have a whole different issue and you know, kind of irrational self-confidence syndrome, mm -hmm. right? Their sense of their talents and abilities far exceeds their actual talents and abilities, mm -hmm. which has actually been established. It's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Oh, right? there's a name for that. Yeah, <laughs> Professor Dunning at Cornell University. That one down. Yes. It's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, where they found out that students who had this extreme confidence in their ability, they're sure they were going to ace the exam, did much more poorly than the students who were very hesitant and insecure about how well they were going to do. So it's like, we don't know what we don't know, and we think we know a lot more than we do. So that's one group of people, which is really important to know that because the research shows that people in a group are more willing to follow the more confident, um, yeah, more confident person mm -hmm. over the more competent person. And everyone Absolutely. listening right now to your podcast is already competent. Stop, mm -hmm. full stop, right? Everyone is already competent. Doesn't mean we don't keep growing and learning, but- right. I think especially women run around trying to get more and more credentialed and more experienced. Yes. Like, yes. like we're good right now. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us, what we really need to work on is projecting confidence. Mm -hmm. So some part of that 30 is they're just kind of arrogant jerks, frankly, right? The smartest yeah. guy in the room kind of thing. scientific term. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah it's very scientific. <laughs> uh, some part of that 30 through absolutely no fault of their own have no idea what it's like to walk into a room, be the only person who looks like them yeah. and experience stereotypes about their social group membership. Again, through no fault of their own. So they have, sure. you know, a certain kind of confidence that comes with presumed competence on the part of other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's another 30 that I think is, is really key. Uh, and this was an aha moment for me. For years, I would give audiences 10 things they could do, 10 things. And then there'd be an evaluation and people would say, uh, it was really good, but I wish she told us more things we could do. And I, I would think, well, maybe I should give them 20 or maybe 80 or maybe 300. <laughs> like, what would be a good number, right? Or they come to the microphone during Q&A and they'd say, this is great, but is there anything else we can do? And my response was always, of the 10 things I just gave you, what have you tried? They will say, well, nothing, but is there anything else they could do? So I realized, I mean, honestly, it took me decades. It was like, what am I missing? I feel like I'm doing a good job. I'm giving people information, but there's this, they, they're frustrated. All of a sudden it hit me, this was like four or five years ago, it hit me. What they wanted was to walk in the door feeling like an imposter mm -hmm. and walk out the door not feeling like an imposter or read a book, yeah. right? At the beginning, yeah. I feel like an imposter. At the end, mm -hmm. oh, that's done. Sure. And, and that's not how it works. Feelings are the last to change. Mm -hmm. So my mantra now is the only way to stop feeling like an imposter is to stop thinking like an imposter. Mm -hmm. Because people who don't feel like imposters, that, that not the arrogant people, but people who really don't feel like imposters, they are no more intelligent, capable, competent, talented than the rest of us. It's just that in the exact same situation where we have an imposter response, they are thinking different thoughts. Right. Which is mm. great news because we just have to learn how to think like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really powerful. Yeah. Well, it's and we, true. We do that, yeah. And we do that a lot in coaching really is taking a look at like, okay, even if you don't believe it right now, right. what is a different, more powerful thought? And starting to rewire some of that. So it's um, simple, not easy, always. No. Um, but I'm glad but you said that, that they, they're not going to believe it, you know, because I've had people say to me, I'll go through all the different ways that non imposters think differently. And, and a woman raised her hand once and she said, Well, what if we tell ourselves all these things and we still don't believe it? And my response is, No, trust me, you won't believe it. Yeah, <laughs> right. right. Like, exactly. You, you believe the other stuff, the imposter thought, right? Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right. You have to think the new thoughts, even though you don't 
believe them, you know? So it yeah. really comes mm -hmm. down to reframing the kind of, yeah. mm -hmm. and it, it, it can't just be, I deserve to be here. Mm -hmm. or I'm an intelligent, capable person. I mean, that's all great stuff to say, but it's not going to move the needle that much. There's three things that people who don't feel like imposters think differently about. They think differently about competence and what it means to be competent. They don't hold themselves to this unsustainable, absurdly high standard that people who feel like imposters do. They think differently about failure, mistakes, and criticism. That's one kind of category, failure, mistakes, and criticism. And they think differently about fear. And if you can learn to think differently in those three boxes, it will just completely change your world. Oh, that's fascinating. There's the recipe. And, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go cook it up. Yeah. <laughs> well, can I give you an example? Yeah, please. Yeah, please. Um, you know, I'm kicking myself because this is in the introduction to my book. And I'm one of these people that rarely reads introductions. I just want to like, get to the book, you know, like <laughs> if it was important, it would be in the book. Right. So, but I put it in my introduction. I wish I'd put it in the book. Hmm. Um, and it was a opinion piece that Betty Rollins wrote in The New York Times in the 1980s. And it was a column called Chronic Self-Doubt. Why does it afflict so many women? And she talked about throughout her whole career as an NBC news correspondent, having that I'm in over my head and they're going to find out feeling. And she wondered if other people felt the same way. So she went to a producer who she said, by the way, was as competent as he thought he was. And she said, when you're working on a big story, do you ever worry that it's going to kind of blow up? And he's like, you know, sure, merrily. <laughs> and she said, well, if it did blow up, would you blame yourself? And he's like, no, you know, sounding very sure. And she said, why not? And he looked at me and he said, aren't I entitled to make a mistake once in a while? And mm. I remember when I first read that decades ago, just reading that line over and over and over, because that was new information to me. Mm. But when you think about it, if you knew you were entitled to have an off day, to make a mistake, to fall flat on your face, to ask for help, to struggle to master something, there'd be nothing to feel like an imposter about. Yeah. True. Oh gosh, I love. It. I know. Just, I can. He, let's when, just like soak in that for. I was about to say when you talked about reading it over and over, I'm like envisioning you just trying to soak it into your brain, like make it part mm. of who you are, because it was so impactful. Yeah. yeah, and you know, it's not to say that we enjoy failure or, or you know, blowing the big presentation or whatever. You could be, right. you could be uh, crushingly disappointed, but not ashamed. Right. The only time you should feel shame is if you didn't try or you procrastinated and it reflected the fact that you did it the last minute. Yeah, then shame is called for. But other than that, you know, you had a bad day. You'll get them next time. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Well, for what it's worth, I like love the introductions and <laughs> oh, like <good>. really <laughs> value them and read them almost like a wedding invitation. It's going to like invite me and tell me exactly what I oh, can nice. expect. And so... Please know it was not lost on okay, <laughs> all good. the readers, even though you you might speed past it. I know that's that funny because I'm writing so. it thinking I'm wasting all this good stuff in the introduction. That's <laughs> no, awesome. I'm like oh, the introduction. I always read the intro as well. <laughs> oh, okay, mm -hmm. well that's yeah. good to know. We're out there, Valerie. We are. Yeah, don't <laughs> don't let people. us down. <laughs> so one of the things that I really liked about the book is. Um, really learning some of the ways that imposter syndrome shows up in ways that are really sneaky or kind of disguised ways. And one of them that I really uh, that stuck out for me was the sure I'm successful, but I can explain all of that, yeah. <laughs> right? Like we were in the right place at the right time, or that person just liked me, or if anyone can do it, so can I. Um, so like, tell me, tell us about some of those other disguises that the imposter syndrome wears. Well, I mean, that, that's a huge one is, you know, people often, you know, you read articles online about imposter syndrome and they'll say, just make a list of all of your accomplishments to remind you of how you know, great you are and all the things you've done. I know I have a degree. You know, I know the stuff I've done. I mean, that's not my problem. <laughs> my problem is I become very good at minimizing or discounting that. Just as you said, I'm lucky, right time, right place, somebody help me. You know, if I could do it, anybody can, all those kind of, you know, we have often some very creative excuses for explaining, explaining it away. Um, one thing I want to flag, though, and you, something you said reminded me of it, is that it's, it's not always imposter syndrome that's holding us back. I think success is complicated. Hmm. And what can feel like 
confidence might be something else. If we're kind of hesitating in the face of success to take on more success, to scale our business or take that, you know, directorship or whatever it might be, the bigger step, it could be because in different ways, success can separate us from other people. It might mean relocating and my parents are getting older or I'd have to move my kids or moving to a place where that's not very racially diverse and how comfortable am I going to be there? Or suddenly I'm going to be the only whatever, you know, in the, at this particular level. Or maybe I became good friends with people in my department and now I'm promoted, I'm their boss. Mm-hmm. Or I'm making more money than my spouse or partner. I mean, for, in different ways, again, success can separate us from others. And in all those situations, you know, a, a promotion, a relocation, et cetera, those are the times when imposter syndrome comes up. So I think it's important to kind of step back when we're hesitating and and look at everything that's going on more holistically and, and, and ask ourselves, if we knew that the relationship piece was going to be okay, would we still be hesitant? Mm-hmm. Or maybe yeah, we define absolutely. success differently, mm-hmm. you know, and we don't want it, whatever it is. Um, you know, we don't want the additional complexity or time or at work or whatever it might yeah. be. Um, but I always encourage women like go for the, big position. You can always change your mind later, but go for it and see how you like being an executive. Yeah. Great advice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We need more and companies are <laughs> looking for more women in the executive level and in their boardroom. So I love that you're giving that advice out. Um, but let's talk about stereotypes, sort of even on the heels of that, Valerie, kind of a nice segue. Um, you mentioned it earlier that that is if we're, so, if we're of um, a group that's often stereotyped, we tend to feel the imposter syndrome more often. Could you expand on how that plays here for our listeners? Sure. You know, um, so some of the groups, you know, whether it be stereotyped, obviously race, gender, um, sometimes based on class, depending on what field you're in. Um, you know, again, international students, people working internationally, have got the same pressures everyone else has, but they're doing it in another culture, another language. Uh, even age. You know, I often ask my audiences, how many of you have been the youngest person in a work context and felt like you were being underestimated because you were young? Mm-hmm. And then how many of you have been on the other end of that continuum where you're the oldest person? I mean, interestingly, when I ask that question to Facebook employees, the 30-year-olds raise their hand. Uh, right? They're feeling like the old ones. The age continuum's a little different there, right? Exactly. Yeah. But the problem with stereotypes and why they matter is there's something called stereotype threat. Hmm. And this is a term coined by Claude Steele, um, who was a psychologist. He was at Stanford and other, other prestigious universities. But what they found repeatedly in these different studies that on a very unconscious level, we were very aware of stereotypes about our group. So, for example giving a math exam, having students just check off a box for their gender before they took the exam, those students, their grades, you know, they wouldn't do as well on the test. The grade would go down. When they didn't have that check box, they, they didn't have an, an issue. Checking off a box for race and gender, then the scores of Asian American women went up because mm-hmm. unconsciously reminding them, oh, Asians are good at math, right. caused them to go up. Even Even men, telling men, you're being tested on social sensitivity versus telling them you're being tested on complex reasoning. Men did better when they were told they were being tested on complex reasoning over social sensitivity. Right. right. And there's many, you know, based on gender as well. I was speaking at a big tech conference in San Francisco. I was very aware that it was an exceptionally young group. Mm -hmm. I had to go to the help desk to get some help downloading the app. And, and I'm standing there and I, I had to fill something out and I couldn't find the at symbol on the keyboard. I was there when email was invented. I've had an online business since uh, 1998. I went online and I couldn't find the at symbol. And I realized it was because I was kind of internalizing the stereotype about older people and technology mm-hmm. and, and it was affecting my behavior. Yeah. So stereotypes can affect your behavior. So they really do have an impact. That makes total sense. Yeah. I mean, I was struck by the chapter really um, we were talking about being the outsider. So I myself, I know, um, can think of the times when I was the only woman in the room 
um, and are the only, certainly the youngest person in the room. And I think of, you know, a lone um, person of color or um, a lone, really anything, anytime you're other or outlier. And um, I do a lot of work around belonging. And it's been really interesting to see some of the research that's come out of that and how much kind of time and energy people who are outside spend just sk- subconsciously scanning the environment to see if they belong and how right. much how much you know time and energy goes into that instead of the actual work and so um you know what are some of the other experiences when we truly are the outlier that helps evoke some of that imposter syndrome that you could share with us experiences that 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 like a woman might feel for example things that might happen to contribute to imposter feelings and that if that yeah i mean if you could like um why you know why is it in if you are that single person or that outlier position like what are you seeing happen um right that is evoking yep. that imposter syndrome well and you don't even have to be the, the only person you could just be doing something that where there's not many of you mm-hmm. right people who look like you uh, there's this wonderful woman who uh, I met in Vancouver, and she is now on the board of like the Canadian Mint, which is a pretty big thing. Mm-hmm. And this guy came up to her at some social event, and he said, how does somebody like you get on a board like that? You know, he just said it just mm-hmm. like that, and she was really kind of taken aback. But she decided to just answer and tell him the like, you know, 20 hoops you have to jump through and all the knowledge and information that you have to have and things you have to study and all. I mean, it's a huge process to get there, but she knew what he was saying, but she didn't take the bait. Mm, I love good. that. I've yeah. actually, so I've had that conversation with someone and it had like this very triggering imposter syndrome response when someone asked me a similar question. And so um, hopefully that never comes up again, but now yeah. I know exactly how I want to respond to it. Well, people time. will say something like, you know, how's your little consulting practice? How's your little podcast? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> how's your little book coming along? You know, there's these ways and, and they're unconscious that, can, but they can kind of trivialize mm. your work. Yeah. You know, I, as you were listing ways that the imposter syndrome can manifest itself, um, something really struck me that I hadn't considered some of the ways that overachieving and overproducing um, was linked here and was like kind of one in the same. Because that's something I very much identified with myself as an overproducer and always overpreparing. And, um, that sometimes we can identify behaviors that we that we do that have those underlying thoughts and i just just like i remember listening to the book like oh my gosh i'm aware of this but i never realized that it was related to imposter syndrome like that was such an aha for me well and you know for you it may not be uh, but for some people, it, it is how they cope. I mean, the same woman I mentioned just now in Vancouver, her name is Cybel Negris. She started the first, co-founded the first domain registration company in Canada in her 20s. She and her husband had one of the biggest commercial real estate businesses in Vancouver, again, in her 20s. But she was doing it on like three hours sleep a night. She was very driven. She was a major workaholic. And she ended up with a bleeding ulcer when she was like 30. And she came to realize that what was driving that, I mean, yes, she was an achiever. We all want to do the best job we can. But for her, she knew she was kind of trying to outrun the no talent police, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so for her, it was kind of a coping mechanism, the the workaholism and the overpreparation. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. That was, um, I've, you know, that was one of the ones that I was driving just like, oh my gosh, there's these behaviors and I hadn't even linked to them, even though I knew a lot about the topic. So um, I loved in the book how really you you shared so much valuable information about all of the ways that it can manifest um, differently for different people. Mm-hmm. One of the things you share, Valerie, that I, I have handed or pointed out to my clients in your book is the list of rights. Mm. And I just want to read a couple for the listeners so they can get a feel for it and then have you expand on how you and a group ended up putting this together Um, so this is on page 249 of the book. 
Our list of rights are simply to say no without feeling guilty, the right to feel and express healthy competitiveness and achievement drive, the right to make mistakes or to be wrong, the right to express pride at my accomplishments. And that's just the first four, and there are 20. And as we talked earlier about this need to rewire our thoughts and to practice some confidence, that's felt like just a beautiful foundation for people. And um, if people are looking to replace thoughts, here's a good list to start with, right? These are the ones we want to be feeding ourselves. So could you talk a little bit more about how those came to be? And, and also, thank you for including those. They're yeah, pretty- and I, I would love to take credit for them. Uh, it was really floating around the School of Education. Uh-huh. When I was a doctoral student there. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't, and, and we used to always produce stuff as graduate students. And it never occurred to us to put our name on things. We just it was out there. So I have no idea who created that. Mm-hmm. Um, I thank them, whoever it was. Mm-hmm. But I've used it very often as a, as a tool. And it's a great piece to ha- hand out in a workshop, for example, or to a client and say, because I, I encourage people to avoid intellectualizing and just go with their gut response. So, so when I hand them out, people just go down and check, 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 check. Like, what are the ones you find yourself having a hard time allowing yourself these rights? But then I invite you to go back and kind of star the one. If there was one that, if you could kind of flip that around, would have the biggest, most positive impact on your life, what would it be? Mm. And that's where you want to start, because otherwise it can be over, overwhelming. Sure. Beautiful. Listeners, you have to be sure you go and check those out. They are a good place to pick through. If you haven't started the book yet, you could go straight to page 249 and get a really good feeling for what's in store for you in the book. So. I think Katie, are you very frozen? good? So, Valerie, yeah. each episode we have. Okay. Katie, hold on. Um, you have to start over. You're frozen. Okay. I was like, Katie's looking at me really intensely <gasps> while I talk. <laughs> really, she was like really listening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so <laughs> Katie, go ahead okay. with your question. <laughs> We're back. So, so, Valerie, each episode we have powerful questions for the listeners that we normally give. And when we interview guests, we instead invite you to tell us what has been some of the most life-changing wisdom, advice, or maybe a question ever posed to you that you can share with our listeners. Years ago, uh, I was still a graduate student, and I was asked to co-lead like a three hour workshop for like 300 RAs, resident assistants in the dorm on, today we would call it diversity and inclusion. Back then we just called it oppression, right? Sexism, racism, et cetera. <laughs> so it was very scary for me because I was going to be doing it with my faculty advisor, this man I you know, worshiped and adored. I'd never used a microphone. I'd never been on a stage that big. So I was really scared. Um, one thing that Bailey said to me was that it, it's our job to make it look easy. Hmm. And I never forgot that. In other words, often we see people doing things and we think, oh, they're just so good at that. Or that comes naturally to them without realizing that people often work really hard. I mean, we all have things that we maybe we're naturally good at. But like I did like a six minute TED talk. And there was nothing in that talk I hadn't said probably thousands of times, but not in that order and not in six minutes. And I practiced that. I first writing it because you have to send it in ahead of time, but writing it, rewriting it, editing it, practicing it hundreds of hours for something I've done thousands of times. Mm -hmm. Because again, people underestimate what goes into making something look easy. And that I'm I'm not sending a message to go over prepare and be a workaholic because something good enough is good enough and just move on and keep going. But when the stakes are really high, you know, it does take a lot of work to, to make it look easy. So like do your homework and then get out there and do it. Love it. Love it. So today we've mentioned a lot of resources. I have no doubt people are going to be looking you up, Valerie. What's the, what are some of the ways they can find you online? It's pretty easy because it's impostorsyndrome.com. And the interesting thing about imposter is you can spell it E-R or O-R and mm-hmm. both are considered correct, which is crazy. Um, <laughs> but I have bo- both domains. Um, so they can go there, Twitter, just Valerie Young. And I think Mm -hmm. Facebook, it's Dr. Valerie Young. Yeah. And then I will also plug your reframe of the week, a newsletter that you send out. So for listeners, be sure you go to her website, sign up for the reframe of the week. 
I love those, Valerie, because I can easily float those out to my clients when I know something resonates that's perfect for them. And they're really great. They're short reads. They get right to the point, change your mindset really quickly. So thank you for those. So listeners, be sure that you go and check those out too. Yeah. And check the show notes. You know, we'll have the all the resources highlighted from the episode and purchase a copy of the book. It's called The Secret Thoughts of Successful Women on Amazon or anywhere you purchase books. If this resonated for you as a listener, you're going to love the book. It, it's mm-hmm. fantastic. And we would love t- for you to connect with us on social media or send us an email. We always love to hear from you. Our emails are tegan at brightarrowcoaching.com and katie at teamawesomecoaching.com. Thanks for listening. Till next time.